This Week in Startups is brought to you by Masterworks, the first company allowing investors exposure into the blue chip artwork asset class. This Week in Startups listeners can skip the waitlist today by going to i.masterworks.io slash twist. LinkedIn, a business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. And monday.com. Manage all your core business activities in one place. Start your 14-day free trial by going to monday.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. My guest today is Laura Huang, and she, Huang, sorry, uh, she was on the pod back in uh, June of 2017, episode 739. And um, she was, at the time, a professor at Wharton. That's right. And you were doing research on angel investors, and somehow we got put in touch. Where I reached out to you, I wasn't sure. You found me. You somehow... Somebody was tweeting about you, I think. think And then I was like, hey, tell me about your research. Because if it's about angel investing, um, I want to know. And now your new book is out, Edge, Turning Adversity into Advantage. Um, And you can go order that right now. If you're listening to me and you're a fan of the pod, go and order the book. Anytime anybody's on the podcast, if you are a true fan, you order and buy the book to show support for the authors who come on in the podcast. So we get even better authors on over time. And that's been happening. Great authors come on the pod all the time. So since that time, you left and you went to Harvard. I did. Uh, So now you're at HBS teaching. I am. What are you teaching? So I'm teaching leadership and entrepreneurship, two different classes. Leadership is a core required class and entrepreneurship is an elective. Got it. Yep. You're teaching leadership to these HBS maniac kids Mm -hmm. who are (laughs) self-selecting for being like massively extroverted, take over the world, like unbelievably confident individuals. I know, aren't speaking. they incredible? I mean, they are incredible. <laughs> it's a bit much sometimes. I'll be honest about the HBS kids. <laughs> they're phenomenal. I mean, That's the they problem are is they're so, so phenomenal. They're so good. And you think that they're not going to be humble and have humility, but they, you know, they really do. They, they are they humble? Sur- they are. They, they surprise me and they're just so fun to teach. They really are. So shout yeah. out to all my students. Shout out. I, I, I always find the HBS students... Uh, are massively confident, but when they get into entrepreneurship, they get a little rattled. Mm, are you describing yourself here, Jason? No. I, <laughs> listen, I, I, everybody knows I went to HBS twice, <laughs> and both times they, they escorted me off the campus. <laughs> like I had like a one-day pass to speak at a <laughs> conference or something. Uh, but the Stanford kids, I found maybe not as like... Uh, like um, confident in that way, but a little bit more uh, creative on the uh, startup side. Is that fair to say when people look at the two programs because they are competitive? Do they do they draw two different types of people? You know, I mean, I think they do draw two types of people to an extent, but the what types those of ideas. Be? Well, I think people who look. If you want to be a real, like, if you if you're if you're passionate about something, you've got this idea, and you're going to start this company. I don't know that you would necessarily initially go to either school, would you? I mean, you know, I think the people who come to HBS and really fall in love with entrepreneurship and realize, hey, you know, I've got all these skills, I've got all these assets, I can really do this. I mean, they've got all of these wonderful experiences, backgrounds that they then kind of flip into doing a startup. And it it does, I I mean, I think that increasingly we're seeing some really creative ideas. Are the majority of folks going to HBS looking to start a company or looking to become senior leadership at established companies go into banking what, what percentage do you think i mean i think the larger percentage is probably the latter that there's more that are looking to go into senior management positions yeah. gm roles that sort of thing but over the course of their careers i mean yeah. some of them start out wanting that and doing that for a couple of years realize that they want to start something on their own and so mm-hmm. we see that you know 90 percent of of people who Um, end up starting a company are ones that have worked in some other industry first and then decide that they want to do that later on. What percentage of the classes ballpark are non-American international students? Because I just spoke at Stanford uh, where they did a case study on me, actually. Um, And 
I think two thirds were not from America. It was amazing the number of countries in the room. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the exact percentage, but yeah. we have this um, in each section. There's a flag day, and it's this this amazing sort of night where you all of the people will give a little presentation about the country that they're from, oh. or you know their their families, and and you know the room is filled with different flags. So oh. I would say like fifty or sixty different flags. So wow. it's pretty yeah not yeah. national origin of American students, but international students who were I think born, both I think uh, both. So people who some that were born in those countries yeah. and you know so yeah any interesting countries like is anybody from north korea russia azerbaijan Iran? azerbaijan mm, i just wanted to be able to say that I chinese practiced students? It. yeah we've got a lot of chinese students that's fascinating yeah that's gotta be the really interesting to have chinese students at hbs yeah we've got students given the are, climate yeah for sure the u.s yeah. and china is so weird weird right yeah <laughs> You know, Huawei, <laughs> yeah. uh, intellectual property theft, uh -huh. authoritarianism, uh, the NBA, criticism of China. Yeah, like, yeah. It's a very, we're, we're so dependent on each other, yet so different. Yeah, but we've got so many different cultures and, you know, at the same time that we've got Palestinians and Israelis and, you know, yeah. there's all sorts of, but I mean, it's, it, it works. It works. Yeah. There's like, there's really this, this climate where it's, you know, you're, you're, you're in these sections together and you're together all day and you're really learning from each other. So, um, it somehow works. Huh. You got to come visit. Yeah, I mean, I go out. Come visit. We're I, not I get, gonna. I get invited out every couple of years, and I and I and I do a talk or I interview somebody. I, last time I was there, I interviewed Chamath on stage, and he, I mean, about five minutes in, he lost like five or six people who just left in disgust, who because he was like, "Listen, you guys are wasting your money here," and blah 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 blah. And he just like <laughs> went crazy. And he's like, "You guys should put the two fifty into whatever." Uh, let's talk about your book. You decided to write this book, Edge: Turning Adversity into Advantage. Yep. There's a bit. A little bit about your story in here yeah. and a little bit about your research. What what made you want to write this book right now? Yeah, I mean, I actually had been like percolating on this idea for a while. Um, the the research that I've been doing for over a decade was around, you know, inequality and disadvantage and people who are underestimated in the startup world and in the workplace. Um, and, you know, I kept coming back to this this thing where people would, would say to me, you know, I put in all this hard work. I just, I put in so much effort and hard work. And sometimes that hard work just doesn't speak for itself. And we all come to this sort of realization at some point in our lives that we put in this hard work and for whatever reason, it doesn't speak for itself and it leaves us frustrated because we what realize- What does it mean it doesn't speak for itself? Well, things You don't are get driven. recognition for it. You don't get raises. You don't get promotions just for doing the work. All of those things, but sort of the outcomes, the success that you're sort of expecting huh. either don't come to you or that you're hitting the same walls over and over and over again. Got it. Um, or you take two people who work equally as hard. Or, and one works perhaps even harder, but that re the rewards go to that, you know, hmm. to that other person. And so, um, it was really around recognizing that perceptions and signals and cues are driving so much of these decisions. And so when people would ask me about my research and they would say, what can we do to level the playing field? What can we do to create, you know, we, if we know that there are certain people who naturally have advantages and we're not one of those people, mm. what can we do? And so this book is really, how do you flip the obstacles, the adversity, the stereotypes that people have against you? How do you flip those things in your favor so that you can gain and create your own edge? And when you refer to other people have advantages that we don't have. Yeah. Specifically, you're talking about cis white guys born in America uh, versus women and people of color not having those advantages. Am I correct? Well, the, the, the typical cast of characters that we think about is absolutely yeah. right. Like gender, race, ethnicity, class, religion, sexual orientation. Those are typically the kind of things that we think about when we speak about disadvantage. Mm. But what I talk about in my book is really everyone has something. It's not just about those kind of things. You can take anybody and you walk into a room. People are ha people have perceptions. They're making judgments about you. They're making attributions about you. Um, you know, so there's lots of examples that I that I talk about. I mean, Ronan Farrow um, said to me, you know, a couple years ago that. He every time people are perceiving him. He's this cis white guy yeah. that has tons of he's the son of Mia Farrow. But 
every time he walks into a room, um, people are thinking, you know, he doesn't, how does, he got access to this person because of who he is, and he doesn't deserve the Pulitzer Prize because he just got it because of who he is. You know, everyone has something. Yeah. And and so recognizing how others see you yeah. and recognizing those perceptions, there's so much power in that right. because that's what allows you to then flip that in your favor to show people who you authentically are when they might be misperceiving you. And is there a danger in people focusing in on that which makes them different? This is like the cis white guy argument. Right. Like, why are you guys so obsessed with this as opposed to the outcomes and the work? So this isn't my position, but this is the position that you probably hear from people, which is, are, are you guys like just too obsessed with the differences of being a woman of color who's gay and maybe that is because you have that in your mind because you're in that victim mentality the oppression olympics i guess people call right, it or right, the intersectionality right, kind right, of right. everything is looked through the lens of um you know gender everything's looked through the it's not always the case that other people are looking through it. Isn't that the case too? Well, I mean, look, structurally we know that there are, that that there are disadvantages that certain classes of people or certain traits lead to disadvantages. There's less gender parity, all those sorts of things. But that's not what it's really about. I mean, we've been talking about this for a really really long time. Like decades. Decades. And yeah. structurally, things, you know, we are we are trying to make changes, but sometimes either those changes are too slow or maybe they're changing but they're not changing in the ways that we intended or they're not changing, you know, all of these different things. And so the perspective that I sort of take is that, number one, everyone has something. And number two, we can't sit around and wait for the systems to change or expect them to change in certain ways that we have to, from the inside, behaviorally, also be able to empower ourselves. So how do we then empower ourselves within what may be an imperfect system to show people what we, you know, how we enrich or provide value or whatever the case may be so that we can have these dip deeper richer relationships with with other people and i thought that was a pretty controversial moment in the book and i'm curious of the feedback you got from people who feel maybe that they're oppressed or maybe um there's bias against them when you say hey suck it up y you can fight the good fight for the cause but the reality is you're entering a system and I want you to individually win. So let's talk about a strategy for you to win as opposed to one where you're going to lose because you want to fight the bigger battle. Let's talk about that issue and the reaction you got to that part of the book when we get back on This Week in Startups. Masterworks.io is the first company to allow any type of investor, whether you're retail or accredited, to gain exposure to the blue chip artwork asset class. I met with the founders. This is a brilliant idea. In a way, it's similar to what I do with the syndicate where I syndicate my angel deals. Imagine syndicating a piece of artwork. Now you can trade individual shares in masterpieces by the all-time greats with the Masterworks art trading platform, including pieces by Basquiat, huh, you may have heard of him, Picasso, and Warhol. These blue chips regularly sell for tens of millions and typically appreciate 8% to 30% annually how does it work well it's very simple masterworks buys a painting and sells shares to investors how brilliant is that when the painting sells you receive your portion of the proceeds or you can sell your shares on the platform for a gain bottom line you can diversify your portfolio by investing in an asset class that's not correlated with the stock market there are 1,000 people on the wait list but fear not twist listeners can skip to the front of the line as usual. I want you to go to i.masterworks.io to skip their thousand person waiting list. That's right. Go right to the front of the line. They're very busy over there by going to i, the letter i, dot masterworks.io. And you're going to skip that thousand person wait list right now. It's a really brilliant idea. I love this idea. And uh, I think it's going to be huge, actually. Okay. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right. Laura Huang is back on the pod. She's Laura. H-U-A-N-G-L-A on the Twitter, but she's now in Boston teaching at Harvard Business School. Uh, and her new book, Edge, Turning Advantage in Adversity into Advantage. So I actually literally wrote in my notes, 
uh, when I was listening to the book, thanks for getting me the early uh, audio. Sure. You read it yourself? I did. Do they fight you on that, by the way? Did they ask so you to use a professional person? No, they didn't actually give me a choice. They said, here's the studio, show up. Uh, and I actually was like, I, I don't I'm, I don't know how to do yeah. this. Don't you want to get a professional to do this? But they said, no, 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 we listened to you. You know, we've listened to your, inter- we listened to your, oh, podcast, this week me, in yeah. startups and we think you can do this. So Great. show up at this, but it was agonizing. How many days? Four? Four full days. Yeah, that's what I'd say, four. Eight hours, had to yeah. repeat things. You know, four or five times. I didn't know that I dropped T's. Things like mm-hmm. instead of saying important, I say mm-hmm. important. Yeah. And important. instead of, yeah. instead of, I say Wharton instead of Wharton. Yeah. And then the great part is they're on the other side of the glass and like, okay, uh, stop. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and let's just say Wharton. That's right. One more time. And yes. you're like, that's what I said. And yeah. they're like, okay, yeah, let's pick it up from Wharton. <laughs> And they don't want to tell you what you did wrong. They just want to repeat it to you because they're so... <laughs> they do. Like, they don't want to offend you. They do. <laughs> uh, and your voice is raw and you're in a tiny room with bad air. Yeah. And it's so quiet yes. that you can hear your stomach grumbling. And they don't give you comfortable chairs because apparently the comfortable chairs make noise. Yes. So you have to sit on a, a hard, stool, hard, wooden yeah, stool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then I constantly got... Can you do that again, but with a little bit more emotion? (laughs) (laughs) So they didn't tell you like, you know what, Laura, that's a little too much emotion. You sound a bit hysterical, lady. (laughs) Is that what what you got? (laughs) That's what I got. Jake out, turn it down. You sound hysterical. (laughs) I was like, I'm already the bubbliest professor that there is. What kind of emotion do you want from me? But Uh, if you want to hear something hysterical, (laughs) type in William Shatner ad read like tape and literally like somebody tried to tell William Shatner to like give it a little more energy. (laughs) <laughs> and like for an audio engineer to give William Shatner any kind of note, yeah. we call it a note in the business, is like, you know, stopping, you yeah. know, uh, you know, a play to, to give like an Emmy Award winning actor yeah. like a note. Yeah. Like he was so offended that the response is just so timeless I think and classic. the plays are the Tonys, though. I think yeah. Emmy oh, Tony, is, te- right, is television. You're right, you're right. Oh. I'm working on my EGOT. <laughs> yes, yes. I gotta get my Emmy first. That's right. <laughs> um, but did people, do people take it the wrong way when you're like, hey, let's separate out your success from the systematic problems in the world, which are irrefutable. Yeah. Obviously getting better. Mm-hmm. You would agree with both those statements? Mm-hmm. Well, you, yeah, yeah, you're kind yeah, of halfway. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I'm just speaking for like my industry, technology and investing, the number of female investors, investors of color, like it has changed more in the last two yeah. years than the previous 20. Yeah. So I mean, do we get to count that as progress yeah, or is it do. it's not enough? And We do, but there's like so many things there that you're just like, even in that statement, right? I mean, I think, okay, the first is that people, it actually has been really well received. People like kind of thinking about, yes, I have this power. I'm empowered both. You know, it, there's the, the outside doing things for the inside and the inside doing things from the outside. And what I mean by that is like structurally things are changing for people who are operating from within the structure. Right. But behaviorally, we're helping to change the structure and that there's this power that comes with being able to flip the biases that other people have against you and yeah. being able to use Use that in your favor, taking those underestimated strengths and making them something that other people see are are actually strengths. Um, But structurally, the other thing is that, you know, I find in my research, for example, that in some instances, in many instances, both male investors and female investors are equally likely to bias against female entrepreneurs. So, for example, I find in some of my research that male um, that women, that that female on, uh, entrepreneurs are more likely to get asked questions about risk and questions about competition, whereas huh. male founders are more likely to get asked questions about the opportunity and how big you could take this and That's your vision. Yeah, you studied and a lot of the conferences out there and the competitions, if I remember correctly. Absolutely, like TechCrunch yeah. and, you know, and lots of different and, and, and found that and so the finding in, in that, that particular research project was that both male and female investors are just as likely to be asking women, women entrepreneurs, those questions that are called prevention-focused questions. Right. So when we, when we think about that, did you further correlate that to the businesses that women create? So was it a, did it have to do with, because it's, it's a correlation. Yeah. 
But what's the cause? So we did it in a bunch of different ways. We yeah, did that's look what I'm at, at yeah. we did look at industries, right? right? So are there certain industries where we're going to ask certain types of questions, right? Naturally, right. if it was a B to C and there's right. tons of competition, and it turned out that the women selected for those conferences had more consumer products. Because when I ran those kind of conferences, we always picked consumer stuff for the stage because it's more entertaining than yeah. hard tech enterprise stuff. So I was wondering if there is. Peel it back a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and you're and you're also more likely to ask more of those specific questions when right. it's a consumer. But no, actually, what we did was we actually controlled for ah. uh, the industry, so experimentally as well as in the field. And so you know, so what that suggests is that yes, it's going to help. It, it can't hurt to have more women investors and have more women mentors. Um, but if both male and females are are hmm. biasing and doing this sort of thing, it's not just the the male yeah. investors. And so structurally, um, it's not going to hurt. But we also have to within be able to to change things from within. But the 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 last piece of that is also that you know a lot of people who have commented on on these this um, you know is it the system versus is it what's happening inside is that you know it feels almost strategic or manipulative in a way and that's why a lot of people don't do that they say don't want to kind of guide these perceptions because they say oh it's about managing impressions and it feels like you know we all know we know we know that person who like kisses up to the boss and we don't want to be that person huh. but this is actually the opposite of that when you're able to manage and guide people's perceptions of who you authentically are. It's the opposite of being strategic because people are going to have perceptions of you whether or not you help them and guide them to who you authentically are or not. You're sort of clarifying more than manipulating. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, it's totally clarifying and it's also bringing your own values and uh, your own vulnerabilities and your own assets to the table I so that you can a, have... on a metacognition level, if the VCs are asking women a question... Mm -hmm in a public forum or in general with something else on their mind. Mm -hmm. So they ask them the competition question mm -hmm. for a reason other than they perceive women to be not as good on the competitive front. Like that would be the surface interpretation of this mm -hmm. is they're asking women about competition because they mm -hmm. feel women are less aggressive or less able to compete. Mm -hmm. Is that what you, you inferred from it when I you mean, first read it? I mean, there's lots of different, there's lots of different perceptions that can be yeah. driving this. I think the important piece of it, especially for entrepreneurs, is that, you know, and it's not just limited to, to gender, by right. the way, right? People with yeah. tech backgrounds, you know, people who may be getting different questions as well, certain industries, all of those, those things yeah. that you're alluding to. I mean, what happens though is that when you get a question, so if I were to ask you a question that's much more around the risk and the competition and the drawbacks of something, yeah. you're more likely to respond in turn by giving me an answer that focuses on competition and the uh -huh. risk and that sort sure because i would have listened to your question and, right. and directly taken head on that's right which but is what i, I train my entrepreneurs you, to do that's right but yeah. if i ask you a question that's much more what we call promotion focus things okay. about the opportunity and how uh, big you can take this you're going to be answering in in turn by ask by answering with a vision oriented large-scale sort of thing and who do you invest in you invest in the opportunity that can go bigger and better so so in one case you're framing everything uh for you know how how is this ever going to win? Like, God, there's so many competitors. And the other one, you're like, uh, kind of assuming it's going to win. And tell me how big can this get? That's right. That's right. right. What other, amazing. where else could you take this? What other yeah. markets? What other customer segments? Fascinating. But this is where that kind of turning your adversity into advantage. Yeah. How do you do that in this yeah, circumstance? In like, this circumstance, say. as soon as you recognize, for example, that you're getting a prevention focused question, you answer the question quickly. You still answer it, but then you turn it into a promotion oriented uh, response. So you yes, say something and. Else, Yeah, yes, and you say, yeah, there are a lot of competitors here, but our product is superior to them in these ways. And so that allows us to go into these other markets and the, right. pursue these other opportunities. And then what what I, I find in some of my research is that you're able to level not only level the playing field, but you even increase your chances above and beyond those mm. other folks. Yeah. Oh really? Oh yeah, because now you've addressed that competition piece and that risk piece. But you've now flipped it, and now not only do they see you as able to, you know, tackle those things, but now you've put something in their head, a new perception, right? A new attribution. Inception. That, that's <laughs> inception. Yeah, no, it's yeah, like Inception. Yeah. You know, it is. It I, is. I so. teach my founders sometimes to do Inception. Yeah. With founder, with investors, which is you would answer the question and say, "We have three main competitors. 
Uh, one of them is people just using Excel or Microsoft Office. Yeah. One is a direct competitor, and one is outsourcing. Uh, and the direct competitor, you know, they've been in markets legacy software, so they're really not that competitive. Um, but you know, it's really on our roadmap. The the second phase and the third phase that's more important. But it's a great question. And then all of a sudden, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa there's a second phase and a third yeah, phase. Yeah. So you you gave them a hint that there's something else coming. That's right. And then they're like, oh, so you're you're you know kind of implanting something there. What? Do yeah, you- that's similar. It reminds me a lot of what I talk about in terms of delight, right? In terms of yeah. delighting your counterpart. And right. Yeah. What? Let's expand on that uh, concept when we get back from this quick break. You talk about delighting people. And in a way, kind of getting them uh, intrigued, I guess, Mm -hmm. would be a good word. Uh, Let's talk about delight and intrigue when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hiring great people is the way to grow your business. You know this. But how do you do that and run your business at the same time? Hiring is a huge time suck. It's the biggest time suck. We all know that. I have a perfect solution for you to get talent right now. It's called LinkedIn Jobs, and it makes it simple and easy. They screen candidates with all the hard and soft skills that you need so you can hire the right person right now. LinkedIn looks beyond the work skills. No, it's not just that. They also put your job in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. Things like collaboration, creativity, and adaptability. That's how LinkedIn makes sure your job post is seen by the people you want to hire. People with the skills, qualifications, and other interests that will help your business grow. And it's no wonder a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn. Here's an example, Takeoffs.io, one of my portfolio companies that we found when we were in Sydney and they moved to the United States. They are an AI-enabled building materials marketplace. So if you're building something, they use AI to say, hey, here's how much wood, here's how many bricks you need. You get the idea. Well, they were looking for an AI engineering lead, which is a tough role to hire for because they required a very unique skill set. They used LinkedIn Talent Solutions to find a qualified candidate. In fact, somebody with a PhD in computer vision so they can look at these floor plans and figure out what you need in terms of materials. You get the idea. Well, that person has now been with them for over a year and they've rolled out several major projects and they're like really been a game changer for takeoffs.io. Examples like this are why companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hire. So here is your call to action. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and you'll get the first $50 50 for free. Just visit linkedin.com slash twist. Again, that's linkedin.com slash T-W-I-S-T and get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions do apply because they're giving you a 50. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest, Laura Huang, and she is back on the program. If you want to watch her first appearance, episode 739, back in June of 2017, when we left you, we're talking a little bit about delight. Um, So what is the strategy of delighting people as it relates to the bias people have against women, people of color, LGBTQ, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the the thing about being at a disadvantage or being underestimated is that you don't always have the opportunity to show how you enrich and provide value. That's the E of edge, by the way. Yeah. So like the framework is about how to gain an edge, but it actually stands for E D G E. The E is enrich. Um and the problem is that we always we don't always have that opportunity to show how we you know, can provide value to somebody else or show what our strengths are. And it be, sometimes it's because we don't belong to the right networks or we don't have, the, we're not in the right groups or we just don't have the opportunity. And the D is for delight, which is when we're able to delight our counterpart or delight somebody else. Yeah. That's the equivalent of being able to crack open that door right. so that we can then show them how we enrich and provide value. And delight is sort of, I mean, it's a hard sort of, emotion or a hard sort of thing to capture but I always think about it in terms of like or I try and like have people kind of think about in terms of I mean think about the very first time that you were in an Uber you may be the wrong person to ask but think about the very first or maybe you're the exact right person to ask but um, the very first time you were in an Uber so forget all the other stuff around like yeah the management team and whatever, whatever, okay? The exceptional but, management team yeah, that built one of the fastest growing <laughs> yeah, companies yeah. in the history the, of Silicon the, Valley. The whatever, whatever, but... Cheers to you. 
<laughs> um, management team. But if you go... <laughs> Careful, that management team is responsible for 90% of my net worth. <laughs> Okay, Take it so, easy, Laura. <laughs> no, no, but go back to that like emotion, no, right? That very first emotion that you had when you were in an Uber for the first time, right? Yes. And it's this this feeling of this is really interesting, yeah, but terrifying, right? Yeah. I'm in a stranger's car, yeah. And he or she just knows where to take me. Right. And I'm not going to give him or her any money. No. And so you're sitting there and you're like, this is just you you get it felt this, like the future you get this feeling of delight yeah you get this feeling of like sure. and it's this feeling where it just makes you take pause for a second and think about something in a slightly different way or consider something in a slightly more surprising or counterintuitive way right when you're able to do that with yeah. somebody else show them a side of you that they perhaps didn't consider or didn't yeah. notice that's when they're going to pause right. and be like oh and want to ask you a question. Mm. And once they ask you the question, that's when you start that conversation and you're able to show them how you right. enrich and provide value. Got it. Um, how would that happen in a VC meeting? Like, it's one thing to talk about it, like with a product. Yeah. But, okay, you're a black female founder who's a lesbian from Texas. Yeah. How would you? And you didn't go to Stanford or Harvard. Uh huh. And you're not a developer. You're a, a sales marketing executive. Yeah. Who now is a startup. I mean. And you got the meeting with a VC. How does that person delight them in the meeting? I mean, the first step yeah. is kind of understanding that like yeah. all of those things that you just said, like they see me as a black woman from Texas who has this background. All th So what underlying perceptions are they making about me? Is it about my competence? Is it about how, how, you know, interpersonally skilled I am about how well I'm able to interact on a team? Like what are those underlying perceptions? And when you and understand- what do you think they are? Let's be candid. Let's talk about candidly what a white VC it, is. I think it depends on who you are and okay. who that, who your other- who that other person is. Yeah. I mean, I think there is some degree of, you know, are you able to execute on this? Um, is this in an idea that has substance to it? Um, is this something that is more of a niche product that is right. not going to be, you know, that that because of your background, um, you're solving a pain point that's only going to be a for black women from Texas, show me that it's going to be bigger or better or something. You right. know, all of these sort of, I think those are the types of kind of things, but that's the opportunity as well, yeah. right? Um, you know, so what I found in a lot of my research when I've looked at, for example, people who are underestimated in those situations or disadvantaged is once you recognize that, for example, the, the perception they have is that you're somehow not as interpersonally skilled, for example. Yeah. So you go in and then once they start asking you questions, you attack and you actually redirect that very perception. So you, right. you give examples of like, let me tell you about a time when I fought for resources for my team. Or right. let me tell you about a time when I closed this deal yeah. and I didn't stop until that deal was signed. And it was, you're giving them examples that then Got it. redirect the way that they see that So you're anticipating the bias, anticipating, even putting aside the word bias, because that's loaded. Uh, let's just say you anticipate those perceptions, the perceptions, and those attributions that they're making. That this about is going to be a lifestyle business. You come in and say, "You might be thinking, is this a lifestyle business? Maybe something that could make five million or ten million a year." Let me explain to you how this is going to get to a billion dollars in sales a year, not a billion dollar valuation of the company, but you know the path to a billion dollars in revenue. Yeah, the the difference though is, I mean. Is that you have to do this and, and the power of, of sort of flipping adversity to your advantage and the sort of strategies and tactics that I talk about in the book is that you do this in a very benign way. Mm -hmm. You don't go and say, I know it's because I'm a woman that you think X, Y, and yeah, Z. Yeah, that's going to go over or, great. It's yeah. not going to go great because the other yeah. person's going to feel confronted. They're going to immediately say, no, 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 it's not about even if they are, right? And yeah. so you don't go in saying like, you th I know you think it's a lifestyle business or I know you think that because I'm a woman or I know that you think because of, you know, my race or ethnicity. But instead, Instead, you look beyond those sort of factors and you look at those underlying perceptions that they're making because of those those ascribed right. so you're not or calling them out on it and yes. being like, okay, you racist, let me explain to you why your bias yeah. is wrong, which is basically 90% <laughs> of Twitter. Well, and I this mean, is why things have broken down on Twitter, I feel, when we talk about race on Twitter or gender on Twitter or bi even bias. Yeah, I Like mean, the conversation you and I are having right now about bias is so uncomfortable 
Are you and uncomfortable? Am I, no, am not I for making me. you uncomfortable? I don't, feel, I don't feel uncomfortable at all. Because <laughs> I, would I know love my to own somehow heart. make you feel uncomfortable. You'll have to let me know the best way to do that. Uh, I'm not sure that <laughs> that's worked for many people on Twitter. Um, but it is the reason I like to talk about it so candidly on this podcast yeah. is I feel like forward progress is made through candid discussion. Yes. And it's it's a lost art today. And on Twitter, it never works because you have a small uh, a window of you know, being able to explain yourself. But on podcasts, because it opens up, when you talk for an hour, we can actually explore this. Yeah. Just the act of me saying, let's take an example of a female black lesbian from Texas. People are like, whoa, oh my God, where is this going? It yeah. just makes everybody uncomfortable. Yeah. So you're saying, hey, it, there's no reason to make people more uncomfortable, but if you do anticipate that you're going to be perceived as a lifestyle business or maybe even less tech because you didn't go to MIT. Uh-huh. And you went to some business school and, you know, you're a marketer. So they, oh, there's yeah. no tech here. Yeah. You're saying, cut them off at the pass. Address that somehow in your presentation. Yeah. I mean, I think- There's a I, way to go about it. Absolutely. And I think part of what you're saying also is that these conversations, um, we, we often don't have these conversations. And the best way to hone your ability to see how other people- perceive you and to be able to, you know, hone that intuition around that interaction is by having these types of conversations. And something that I teach in my in my leadership class to my students is one of the reasons that we don't do this is because we don't think enough about somebody's intent mm. versus their the impact of what they're sort of saying. I mean, who amongst us has not said something to someone else that we then, for whatever reason, haven't had, didn't get a chance to, like we we leave thinking, oh, I hope that person didn't think that I meant that because I yes. did it, but it could have been interpreted. So I hope that they didn't think that I was thinking. Well, well certainly 100% and- of married couples have had this experience <laughs> where what they've said and how it was interpreted oh, were no, two wildly no, different no way. things. I communicate perfectly with my husband. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is- yeah. Right. There, there, this is another thing that I think, you know, if you're on Twitter like you and I are, yeah. or if you're involved in the open discourse of race, gender, bias, and especially in the tech industry, there, there's just no room for intent anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I always stop and say, okay, this person said something that was horrible. Uh-huh. Um, what was their intent? Because yeah. I did it myself. Yeah. I said one time, we were talking about... Um, uh, black founders, just people of color in tech. And I said, one of the problems is, you know, people have set this ridiculously high bar for who they will meet with. And that bar is typically a million dollars, $2 million in revenue. And if you raise the bar that high, then people who are just starting out are not going to ever get a meeting and they're not going to ever get the feedback that you're doing. So if you're a VC, just lower the bar of who you'll meet with and meet with everybody or take 20% of your schedule and meet yeah. with people. But let me guess, it's and the I, lower the bar piece. The lower the bar that, thing yeah. triggered a bunch of people. Yeah. They're like, what did yeah. you say? You're saying lower the bar for black people? And I was like, well, no. I said lower the bar for a meeting. But by that time, 50 people had run with it. And I specifically yeah. was referring to who you take a meeting with. Well, I think the lower, I mean, like there's, the, there's- The quality of the company, the stage yeah, of the company. No, I mean, I just And think then that I just there's... deleted the tweet and, re- and, re- <laughs> and restated it. I just think that there's a lot of, um, like there's so many things that are now loaded or so, you know, I mean, it reminds me of when I said, I at one point- Triggering. Was like, yeah, it's very tricky. I said something along the lines of, um, you know, if you don't have, you can, if you don't have privilege, you can make your own privilege. Whoa. And Hold I think Hold on a that- second. <laughs> You're about to get- canceled as your counsel <laughs> saying you can make your own make privilege. Your privilege you can make your own privilege and if you take <laughs> the loaded piece i mean privilege is really we talk about unfair advantage all the time edge. right well okay well unfair I don't, well, advantage yeah. well uh, is yeah. an edge is unfair, there a difference yeah but the unfair piece is uh, what bothers how you people. got the edge how you got that, what yeah. makes it unfair. Got it. And I think Edge, what what I really, you know, sort of believe is that it's not an unfair thing. It's something right. that you have, but for whatever reason, people are not seeing it or it's undervalued or, yeah. you know, it's it's an underpriced asset that right. once people understand, got it. they're going to be like, whoa, this has huge How does one build their privilege? How, how does one manufacture their privilege? Well, manufacture is also not a good word, Jason. Okay, so. create <laughs> Yeah, creates, fine. Manufacture could be know. perceived as falsely manufacturing because it's not real. Well, but manufact- I meant manufacturing yeah. as how does one build their privilege? 
curate their own privilege. Yeah, that's a good and word. I mean that's that's really what the book is about. Yeah. Like you know how you enrich and you know how you enrich and provide value. Yeah. You're able to delight others. Right. G is for guide. You're right. guiding the perceptions of others. And E, the final E, is for effort and hard work. Right. And we tend to think that effort and hard work comes first. Uh, that you put in the hard work and that everything will speak for itself. Right. But actually, effort and hard work comes last because if you know how you enrich and how you delight and how you guide, yeah. that's when your hard work works harder for you. Interesting. And, and this is a typical complaint from people who feel there is or who have experienced bias uh, and feel that bias is holding them back is that, listen, I have the skill and I've been putting in the effort, but I'm not getting the recognition. I'm not getting the reward for that effort. Absolutely. And part of it is guiding people through, as you're saying, hey, here is why I am hitting the targets that you need to see in order to get the reward. Yeah, I mean, it's a perspective on how you authentically can understand because sometimes, I mean, sometimes people don't even, you know, it's hard to really even understand what are your superpowers? What are the things yeah. that you're really good at? What are your weaknesses that you need to make sure aren't liabilities? Mm. So sometimes it's that piece of it. Sometimes it's being able to dynamically um improvise when you're in situations so that you know how you delight. Sometimes it's being... Um, you know, being accurate or being in tune with how people really see you and those perceptions so you can correctly guide them to who you are. Um, so it's a, a variety of different things. But I think it's, um, you know, I have I have a, it's called the edge quotient where mm. you can take this quiz and actually see like how equipped are you? Which of those categories are you sort of lacking and which, mm. which do you need to sort of work on and how can you think about strategies to do that? All right, so. when we get back from this final break, I want to know what the strategy is for at the very least getting credit for the ideas that you brought to the table uh, and for your own execution in the workplace when we get back on this being startups if you're running a business like i am and the 200 startups we've invested in are you've probably got 30 40 50 projects going at any given point in time but you as the founder and ceo or a vice president you may not know where all those projects are at Right? And how nice would it be to centralize all of those projects and feeds into one place so you can manage them effortlessly and increase accountability? Monday.com powers teams to run workflows, processes, and projects in one digital workspace. And it helps them unleash their potential to achieve results in all aspects of their work. Monday.com is an intuitive work operating system, a cloud-based software platform where teams plan, run, and most importantly, track all of their work. Here is an example of how my associate Presh, uh, the youngest associate in Silicon Valley, is using Monday to track the companies that we're considering for an accelerator. And you can see here, he's talking with them to see if they're a good fit for the accelerator. We've got so many companies in our inbox that Presh takes the companies in our Goldilocks zone and he organizes them into a beautiful Monday.com table. He also adds his notes in the comments section so the team can easily go and look at the recommended next steps. This has been an unlock for us as a team, as you might suspect, because we're using Monday.com, performance and accountability has gone up. You're going to get more done with less resources, and that's what it's about. That is the name of the game. And more than 100,000 companies around the world use Monday.com to free their teams to move faster and let them focus on the work that is required for their specific talent. So here is your call to action. I want you to start a 14-day trial and see uh, how great this product is. And you can do that by going to monday.com slash twist. That's Monday, as in the day of the week, M-O-N-D-A-Y.com slash T-W-I-S-T, which is the hashtag for This Week in Startups. Okay, uh, thanks, monday.com, for making great software and making us, including Associate Press, even more efficient. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome to This Week in Startups. My uh, cancel guest, Laura Huang, <laughs> is here with me, cancel Jason Calacanis, <laughs> because we're talking about gender, race, bias, and just getting an edge, turning adversity into an advantage is out right now. Uh, go buy it. Again, uh, if you're a fan of the pod, you need to buy whatever book. I know you guys all got a little chatter, and uh, the book's well worth reading. It's a great read. A oh, great listen, actually. I'm halfway through it, listening to it. Um, you're not the whole way through listening to well, it? Well, here's the thing. You're canceled. I know. I should be. <laughs> I usually do get through the whole thing, but I got sick this weekend, and I got three kids, oh, and two excuses, of them got sick. Excuses. I know, excuses. I know. You need to be guiding my perceptions better to... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, as a single, uh, a single you're parent. not single. <laughs> I'm just trying to pull a single parent card. I'm trying to pull a single parent card, and I can't. Um, as an outnumbered parent, <laughs> okay, <laughs> three to two. Um, but yeah, the audiobook, uh, great. Thanks for sending me that in advance, by the sure. way. Sure. The MP3s, and I was I've been listening to them. Um, so when we went to break, I want to know. I hear constantly. Consist consistently might be a better word since we're focusing on words. I hear consistently from women that they don't feel they're getting recognition for the work they've done. And I'm constantly hearing from men how much they've done <laughs> <laughs> and how much they deserve a promotion and raise. Um, it's like incessant. Men are like literally nonstop coming at me with, you know, their their high fives. Um, and women, sometimes I hear from them that they don't feel they got credit. You have strategies around this. Is this a, a, a trend that you hear about a lot in your research? I mean, this is sort of the I work twice as hard for half the rewards kind yeah. of thing. True phenomenon. And yeah, I mean, yeah, there is there is truth behind that. Yeah. Um, but in that truth is also what are you going to do about that? Right. It is it is what it is to some extent. Right. And so, you know, what I talk about in the second half of the book is. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started from the back. Did you? Yeah, I did. you yeah. I always uh, do. Right. <laughs> so you really liked chapter 13. No, what I do is I, st I always start with the last two chapters. It's my strategy for guests on the show. I, listen I start with the last two chapters. Yeah. Because I feel like they summarize what they've said in the book. Then I go back and read, the listen to the entire book. Huh, interesting. So that I get to yeah. hear the end twice. That's some good BSing, Jason. Um, it's, the, it's the God's honest truth, actually. Okay. If you actually, if you ever want to do it on a book, you will, your retention will go way up. All right, interesting. Because you've listened to the summary twice. Yeah. At the beginning and the end. Okay. And good authors will a lot of times sort of tell you up front, hey, here's what we're going to do in the book. Yeah. But there's nothing like that summary. Where okay. They, where so they the up. summary that you sort of read, yeah. which you listen are so, to. yeah, that you listen to. Um, you know, I talk about how a lot of, I mean, it's it's this we we are jaded and bitter in lots yeah. of ways because when our hard work doesn't speak for itself or when we put in the effort and the rewards go to somebody else or that we keep or we keep hitting the same walls over and over and over again we keep become jaded and bitter or you know there's people who have wronged us or and we hold on to that it's like a chip on our shoulder i ask mm. my students sometimes think about a time when somebody wronged you or some situation that still has you feeling angry i mean within 10 seconds people can recall two or mm, three instances really you can too come on not too many i kind of let them go but i'm older okay, in my well, career yeah well, and because you've re read the last chapter yeah. of my book um, and so <laughs> I, yeah so i talk about you know how a lot of times we things become we let it make us bitter mm. and instead of it whenever something is starting to make us bitter we need to be asking ourselves how does this make us better not bitter got it and so when we think about making ourselves better and not bitter, how then we understand that sort of negative, that failure, that those those drawdowns, and what is it that we value? Why does it still bother us? Why is it still a chip on our shoulder? What's the one you can tell me without telling the names and, and protecting the innocent? But you're in academia, so the stakes are so low that you must have had people try to screw you over <laughs> oh. many times. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I really will get canceled when I start talking about the times I've been screwed over in academia. No, you know, loyalty is so loyalty is so big to me. Like that's like me too. One of the it's my number one. It's pro yeah. It, like I feel like loyalty, hard work and loyalty are my two. Well, hard work should come forth yeah, after yeah. enriching, delighting, and guiding. Yeah, now that you yeah. know that, but no, I mean <laughs> loyalty and trustworthiness and sort of yeah. empathy. Like those are my three. I feel like you switch out any one of those and you become like a completely different sort of person. And I mean, I think the times that still sort of it's it's those situations where um you know someone stabs you in the back and right. you're like and especially when you value loyalty mm. and trustworthiness and yeah. you and you really like have somebody's best interests at heart and then you realize that other people are those who for just a tiny bit of personal gain will step on lots of other people yeah so i think it's those and i think this is not unique to me. I think we all sort of have these experiences where we feel that this has happened, but you have to make it, how, how does this make you better and not right. bitter? How do you change that? How and, do you? And I mean, I think it's- You didn't tell you me know, yours, by the way. Nice deflect. I asked you yours. I, I gave you the I gave you the macro. You didn't give me your example, but there's yeah, one I can yeah, see it in your yeah. eyes. There's one that there's actually two, but yeah. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. make a composite. Yeah, composite <laughs> it for me. 
that person's not going to listen to this. They're a, they're a narcissist. The last thing they're going to do is, is true, they are. take the time they, to listen they, to you and your success now. Yeah, no, they are a narcissist because, they're, you know, anyways. Um, but Go ahead. Um, tell us but <laughs> what happened and then tell us how I it feel like I'm like on, I feel like I'm on like the Ellen show or something. Well, and Ellen is not, trying I don't want you to, to cry, but Ellen is trying saying? to get me to secretly reveal like the gender of my, I'm not pregnant, but I'm feeling yeah, like gender <laughs> reveal. <laughs> the gender yes. reveal of my, of my baby or something. So it's, I've always dreamed of like being in a situation when somebody tries to like get information out of me on like a talk show. So this kind of feels this like is this. It. it's nice. So tell us um, the composite anyways, of how so, you got this person and the narcissist who uh, screwed you and then how you let it not make you better. Go ahead, Well, I think the, I'll start with the second piece first okay. and then we'll ease our way into the, I think the, um, you know, the not letting it, I mean, there's, it's entrepreneurs do this all the time as well, right? You have to sort of ride the emotions while understanding those emotions, but not getting carried away by that. So mm -hmm. what I mean by that, like entrepreneurs sometimes, you know, you have these extreme highs and these extreme lows and often they're all in the same day. And you have to be able to, I think one of the characteristics that makes a really good founder is being able to understand that there's going to be huge failures and huge successes and huge, really depressing days and really exhilarating days. And while you're understanding that, still being able to feel those emotions mm. while not getting carried away with it. Consumed and by them. Yeah, you don't want to be consumed by them, but you no. want to understand them because there's so much data in those emotions. Uh. There's so much data in why does it feel so depressing? Why is it like, what is it that's really nagging at me? And understanding that sort of feeling. And yeah. I think- Unpacking it. Unpacking sitting it. Sitting with it. Meditating with on it. it. And knowing what I talk about a lot, which is life rhymes. Mm. And we have situations in our life that have made us feel a certain way. Yes. And then a couple years later, we'll, we'll, it'll be a different context or a different mm. situation, but we'll feel that same emotion or that same feeling, like something won't sit right. Mm. And there's so much information in that. That's how we build our experience and our yeah. mental models and our schemas and our intuition. That's how we sort of hone right. it by being now able to- Now give us yours, because then I'll so, give you mine. You give me you, your- You give me yours first, and then I'll give you mine. I, you know, I'm trying to get you to answer a question here. I'm the host, and well, you're, you're constantly you're, throwing you back You said you were going to give me your, yours too, so- Well, you I was going to give it to you as a reward for giving me yours first. <laughs> I need a little sweetener. All <laughs> right. Okay, fine. I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yeah. so speaking of edge, I have always looked at when you are screwed, when yeah. people do come at you, and they do in business. Yes. Uh, and I, I long looked at business as war. Yeah. Um, and there's really two types of confrontations when it comes to violence. There's quick and there's extended, right? Yeah. And if you look at the samurai, and that's why Toshiro Mufune is on the wall over there. Uh-huh. Um, and... Or, or the Jedi, uh, which were modeled after the samurai, um, when they take that sword out and they use it, and if you ever see Yojimbo, there's a famous scene where Shiro yeah. Mifune takes the sword out and he cuts a guy's arm off and it lays on the floor. And uh, then they cut to the sword being put back uh, on his belt and into the sheath and the blood being taken off of it. And it happens in seconds. And then it's over. As opposed to a barroom brawl, which goes on forever, yeah. or a war yeah. that goes on forever. And I think in my younger years, sometimes I went to war with people and it was never ending mm -hmm. um, because it was not definitive. And what I've learned over time is, you, you know, I went to war with people over decades or a decade. Now, if I have to go to war with somebody, it's going to be either they're ignored and they're just ghosted forever mm -hmm. and I just give them zero attention. Mm -hmm. Or... The possibility is like the cantina scene in the original Star Wars where Obi-Wan takes out and he says, listen, this young one is not worth your trouble. The guy says, well, you know, I want to fight anyway. And he takes out the sword and cuts the guy's arm off. Remember that scene? Mm -hmm. Lucas took that from Kurosawa. And then that's why Kurosawa's book's on the wall here. It's one of my heroes. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, that is a great book, something like a autobiography. Um, he stole that. Mm -hmm. Lucas from Kurosawa from the Yojimbo scene and you see the guy's arm fall on the ground yeah. and then the lightsaber's put away and turned off just like the sword went away and it's turned off mm -hmm. and so now when somebody does something to scream it didn't happen recently I just swung the sword cut their arm off put it away mm -hmm. and never show that person's name or that person will never be in our, my life again 
never will I take the sword out again because I cut their arm off already. I don't, they already learned their lesson. But not everyone has that opportunity to oh, cut yes, someone else's do. arm oh, off. Oh, they do, they do. You no. must just, you have to train with the sword. <laughs> just train. Sounds almost like a Count of Monte Cristo sort of thing. Like you train and you train and you train. And then like, pow, there's no, like But your... didn't he stay in the jail for a long extended period of time and then got his revenge? But he did his revenge. Like he yeah. unraveled it, it all at once. be careful with revenge and... because it's a shallow victory afterwards. Like trust me, in your Jimbo well, what, or in Star Wars. What prevents Wars, that other person from like retaliating? They have one arm and they want to keep it. I mean, I know talk it's talk about speaking in generalities. You're giving no, like trust you're me, talking if, about if somebody comes at you, yeah, and you show them that sword, yeah, and they experience what it feels like for that blade to hit, they very rarely would say, "You know what? I'd like to be in front of that blade again." And in this case, it was just dropping the top legal firm in the world and a bunch of paper on somebody and saying. Bink. Yeah, but see, this is the Come thing. Back at me. This is the thing about. I mean, not everywhere. This is. I mean, frivolous lawsuits are everywhere. This, well, this is, is not like, frivolous. This well, is okay, a letter. Okay, okay, okay. But I. <laughs> this is a letter. This with, is here's like, what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the thing. I mean, we the 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 legal system is supposed to be about justice and about yeah. truth and about all these sorts of things. Do you believe that it is? Um, I believe it's flawed, but the best one we got, you know, so far in humanity. Um, but, uh, and, it, and it can work for the underdog more than the person who is the person with the big uh, chip stack, but it could also work the other way. And so I was recently advising somebody who got screwed and didn't have a lot of power. Yeah. It is a good, uh, is, is a valid observation you're making, which is I have resources now and I have the sword. Yeah. But when I didn't, somebody else was in a similar situation. And I said, you know what you should do? You should write a blog post. And you should detail exactly how this investor screwed you. I said, and then you should say to them, as they've ousted you from your company, um, I, uh, I disagree with what you've done, and I'm not going to sue you, but I'm going to write this blog post, and I'm going to publish it, um, and I'm going to give the story to the Wall Street Journal and Business Insider and anybody else who will listen, and I am going to tell every founder who contact, I'm gonna put your name in the title and every founder, I'm gonna put in the first sentence, email me anytime if you would like a reference for this individual. Right. I said, and then watch well, exactly that, how quickly, and that's a different type of sword. And then that investor sues you for slander. No, no, no. Why not? Because the investor knows that suing a founder is the worst possible recourse and settling with the founder is the best possible recourse because then they go, you're crazy and you don't care. And let me tell you something. There is one person you do not want to fight with, which is somebody who has nothing left to lose. And that's the, there's, see, this is where having nothing left to lose is a very powerful thing. When you truly get screwed and you're yeah. got nothing. Yeah. Then the other person has to realize, well, you're backed into a corner, so you might as well fight your way out. There's a chance you might make it out. Mm -hmm. And the person then who has a lot at stake, who has the money and the power, says, do I want to risk everything I've spent 50 years building to have this blog post on the internet? And that person, I'm going to sue them, and they have nothing, and then they're just going to write more blog posts? Yeah, it's so complicated. You I mean, underestimate I think, the power of the public. I just think the there's public. so much. There's so much nuance there, right? There's yeah. the nuance behind the the person with the resources who can continue, right. right? Whereas the other person can't continue because they don't have the resources for the for the um, you know for the lawyers and the legal. You you underestimate that person who can then write his or her own blog post, even if it's complete lies. All of these sorts of things. I mean, yeah, I the, think the, the the VC would never do that because once they're faced with the possibility of other founder seeing them mixing it up with a founder and not being able to con control that relationship they will just say it's not worth dealing with that person this actually happened online just over the last couple of days with a vc who's been tweeting crazy stuff um and every a couple of people have bad stories about this person i won't say their name on the show but um it just makes it very hard for that investor then when they're having a conversation with a founder to say, I'm not going to uh, create radioactivity around your startup. Yeah. Right, well, it's the last thing you want. Tell us your story. 
we're going to talk about, I mean, there's so many hints of what you said already. Yeah. I mean, obvious when I feel like the bitterness comes when there's legal sort of things. And I mean, but, but that is, I'm going to get some of your advice offline about, yeah. <laughs> about these sort of well, things. Well, here's the thing so. about bitterness. It's yeah. a lot of times if people feel there's no off ramp, you know, like they said with the uh, Iran situation, yeah. give them an off ramp. Yeah. If people feel powerless. Yeah. They will try to take their power back yeah. and that could be very dangerous for you. So that's why I like the art of settling. Yeah. That's why it's kind of nice when you take the sword out and you're like, here's a sword and I'm about to swing it. And then they're like, oh, no, you can put the sword away. Okay, great. Or you swing it and it's like, you still got one Assuming arm left. Assuming that that other person is a rational, logical person. But anyways, you know, um, clearly, me. clearly there's a lot of, clearly there's a lot of feelings and emotions that see, this is what I said within 10 seconds, yeah. my students can bring up things that are decades long, you know, years, year long sort of bitterness and, and things that they can, I mean, we all have these, these and sorts you were of about things. to tell us yours so, after I told you and mine. And so that so was, yeah, I mean, it, it involved sort of that. I'll give you a sort of a composite, composite but, um, yeah. you know, I had someone that I was, that I was mentoring <laughs> and pretty much, um, was helping this person along doing all these sorts of things. And then that person, um, basically scooped a paper that I had already started working on. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that's sort of the composite. Wow. So the person scooped your idea for a great paper and ran with it. Yes. And claimed sole ownership of it. So that would be like you worked on the screenplay together and they're like, yeah, you don't get, when I get win best this would be like you and I, we're Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. We right. went, we wrote Goodwill Hunting. Right. Best picture. Best picture. I get to go up and get it. And you then, don't. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, man. Yes. You know, this happened to the person who wrote the screenplay writer of Pulp Fiction with Tarantino got kind of marginalized in uh, that yeah. process by Harvey yeah. Weinstein. And, he's and I think vocal this about happens. It. This happens often. How did this you deal not... with that bitterness? And what did you carry um, well, forward? Well, there was lots of dimensions associated with that I too. Assume, yeah. I mean, but I, I think the, I think. Were you friends with the person? Did yes. You, and friends no more. No. Pa so this person cared more about that paper than the friendship with you. Yes. How does that make you feel? Wow, this is feeling really like talk showy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you wanted it, so I'm giving you your moment. You said you're like, I always dreamed well, of it. I want, I want my We're moment. We're making dreams come know, true here, Laura. I want Laura. my moment with, with, with Oprah and Ellen. I feel like, I mean. <laughs> oh, what? I can't be, I can't have empathy here and have a moment with you? Oprah and Ellen would probably have read my whole book before. That's fair Yeah, point. yeah. Fair so. Fair point. Uh, <laughs> I'm working my way through it. You don't have no um, idea what's on my plate. Uh, but uh, <laughs> seriously, like that's got to be a gut punch. Oh, it's devastating. It's yeah. devastating. So, you know, um. Wow. But, but I mean, that is, there's, there's an element of that, I think that we all have. And so like, it's, that is sort of the adversity. We have to flip that adversity into our advantage. So you were so. bitter. How has it made I'm not you... bitter anymore. I'm better yeah. now. Yeah. How, you, how did you convert that bitterness into betterness? <laughs> you know, I think, um, it sounds so funny, but there's some people that you just, you can't ever negotiate with. I think right. like someone once said that, um, Gosh, I really don't want to like. Now I'm like saying, but there, there, a friend of mine who was in the military, he was like, yeah. you know, you just don't negotiate with Kim Jong Il, yeah, because there's no, there's no way to really, you, you know, you don't, yeah. So you just kind of, it is what it is. You and have to you, isolate you, them, and yeah. you isolate them, and you go on with your life, and you right. sort of do your thing, and that's really, that's really what it is. Yeah, what I tell people is, um, I had somebody, uh, I had loaned some money to very small amount mm -hmm. and uh, they said hey uh, i'll write you a check back mm -hmm. that's when i was in my 20s they write me a check back for the 50 bucks i loaned them check bounced mm -hmm. i got charged 15 bucks because I, I guess you get if you <laughs> put in a check that you that bounces you get i, I got charged and i was like what the heck is this now uh -huh. it's this is costing me 15 dollars more than the 50 uh-huh and i was upset about it and my brother said to me that's the best fifty dollars you ever spent. Yeah, you never have to talk to that person again. They are going to avoid you forever because they don't want to see you because yeah. they don't want to give you the fifty bucks back, right. and therefore you paid fifty dollars to eliminate that person from your life. Right, and that's how I felt about you know my breakup with Mike Arrington was very famous. Like, uh -huh. and that was one where I just didn't take the sword out. I got into like a, a wrestling match, and we were like in a mud pit, uh -huh. and a friend of mine was like, 
you know, you guys are in a mud pit and like when you're in a mud pit like that, like the pig likes it. Yeah. And nobody <laughs> yeah. knows who the other person is. I'm not saying my Aaron is a pig. No, no, no. I'm just <laughs> no, saying I'm just in that situation, he did enjoy being in a wrestling match with me. Like it was like something he clearly enjoyed. And it was and cutting that person out then led to me doing launch. Yeah. And the funds. Yeah. And the Uber investment and all this other stuff. So literally getting Mike Arrington out of my life was like cutting off like a hundred pound anchor. I'm just chuckling because my friend, a friend of mine actually gave a very, the, the same analogy. She just used it a different context. Yeah, she ahead. said, she basically said pretty people shouldn't get into bar fights. That's the way I feel. <laughs> I, I look in the mirror and I'm like. <laughs> You want this face to get in a bar fight? That is like the, you have nothing left to lose. Like the, right? People who are, yeah. you should be No, the be guy getting, who's got like a scar in his face is right. like, yeah, let's go. I mean, let's have a knife fight. person who's going, right. They don't care, but pretty yeah. people shouldn't get into bar fights. Yeah. It's, it is a nice <laughs> way of saying, what is your hope for people reading the book and what they ultimately come away with? If Somebody walks up to you in the street two, three, four, ten years from now and says, hey, I read Edge. Um, here's what it did for me. Yeah. What would be the most meaningful thing for them to say to you? Yeah, I mean, I have gotten so many really thoughtful notes already that have been so meaningful. And I think, you know, the these these notes and these, this is who I was actually writing. As I was writing the book, I was thinking of these people who are, who are aspirational and believe in themselves, but other people haven't for whatever mm. reason. And so it's really this message of, you can empower yourself. You can flip all of this. You can flip obstacles and stereotypes and challenges flip that in your favor. And when you're able to flip that in your favor, that's when you can create your own edge. Yeah. And it's not, this book is not just for women or people of color. This is intended for anybody who feels that they're being marginalized and who wants to get an edge, correct? Absolutely. It's yeah. both those people who are trying to succeed and right. trying to get somewhere but feel like they can't. I also, as I was writing it, there was a number of instances where I found that, um, you know, parents, for whatever reason, will ask professors for parenting advice because they think that, I don't know, whatever. Um, well, you're <laughs> but, a professor. Well, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they you would- might be able to teach you know, them something. And I was yeah. realizing as they were sort of asking is that, um, you know, parents are fighting so hard to try and give their kids an advantage. Yeah, right? you want to talk they're, about an edge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're fighting so hard. We see instances where parents are like illegally buying their yeah. kids SAT A bad scores edge. Yeah. and trying to an get illegal them, edge. yeah, buy them into colleges. But on a more benign, in a in a more legal way, yeah. like private coaches, extra yeah. tutoring, extracurriculars. But instead of fighting so hard to give your kids an edge, which might just be one dimensional, instead teach them how to. So how to create yeah. their own edge, teach them how to create their own edge so that they know how to go into a situation and how they enrich and how they can delight and how they can guide those perceptions of others. So they have that advantage in every context. Today, almost every skill you want to learn is available on YouTube or online or on Coursera or edX or MIT courseware. Or at Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School has, <laughs> are, is, are all the courses online? Well, we, uh, HBX, so there's an online. Yeah, yeah and yeah. The, all the courseware is free. You only pay to get the paper, mm -hmm. is my understanding yeah, yeah. for these things. If all of the courseware in the world is out there, and then all the prerequisites are on Brilliant.org, which we're investors in, or um, Khan Academy, those places, how do you account for motivation and the fact that so many people who... Um, don't feel they can get an edge are spending five hours a day watching television and just not motivated to add skills or educate themselves when all of this free education is out there. I was looking at MIT courseware recently and I was watching these videos. I'm like, these videos on YouTube are like the huge unlock to getting a job anywhere yeah. in, t in tech, like machine learning course, right? Yep. And they have 300,000 views. And I'm just like, you know, and then some Idiotic YouTubers got, you know, 100 million views for a video, yeah. a billion views. How do you account for motivation and the fact that so many people want to complain about the system being broken, uh -huh. they don't have an edge, the system's, you know, stopping them, yet they don't want to go get these skills which are freely available online? Yeah. I mean, I always say that everyone can learn it. 
Everyone can learn this. Everyone can learn to create their own edge, but not everyone is willing to. Uh And that willingness comes from a lot of different factors. I mean, one factor is that you have to be willing to be okay with failure and embarrassment. You're going Mm -hmm. to embarrass yourself. And the more you, and when you embarrass yourself, most people sort of say, oh, like, never again. I'm never going to put myself in that situation. Yes. But that's actually the situation in which you should be doubling down. You double down. And like, because, I mean, we don't learn as much as we'd like to say, like, make that mistake once and then you'll never make it again. I don't know. Sometimes it takes me two or three times making the same mistake before I really get it. And so you have to be willing to have that humility and that failure and that embarrassment to to sort of learn this. I mean, I think the the other piece of it is that, you know, we, we there's so much information out there. There's almost now too much and so we assume that we have everything at our disposal but really in order to grow you have to prune and companies have to do this people have to do this you have to go back to like what are the basics what are your basic goods what are your basic things that really make you and companies as they grow and scale they lose out on this all the time they start adding features they start adding you know you know different segments all these things but go back to what you're good at if you are essentialism yeah if you are an Italian restaurant and your thing is like homemade pasta yeah get it right yeah make sure that that stays right even as you grow and expand your menu and do all these other things. I was explaining this to somebody. Uh, we were eating in a Japanese restaurant, a ramen place, and uh, they were my favorite ramen place in San Mateo. And they were like, uh, I, 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 uh, they don't have like tempura. And I was just like, I, I, you have not been to Japan, right? They're like, no. I'm like, if you said this in Japan, they would say, you're in a ramen restaurant. If you want tempura, the... The restaurant two doors down is a tempura restaurant. Right. And in Japan, it's like the katsu restaurant is the katsu restaurant right. and the Kobe right. beef and the sushi place. Like, and, and in America with this weird perception that like you go to a Japanese restaurant and they're like, there's the katsu and there's your sushi and right. there's your ramen and there's your tempura. Right. It's like, there's no thought of like, which one are they excellent at? And you cannot be excellent at all four or five things. That's right. Pick one and be yes. excellent and deeply excellent. This is what I, this is, because I get this advice too, like, hey, talk to my kid. Or what should I tell my kid? And I'm like, the ability to learn skills quickly is the unlock. Like if you can add a skill in a very short period of time, it is so impressive to employers and so effective when running a startup and I was just having a meeting before we got on air with a founder who just was a hardware founder who taught himself all the sales and marketing stuff. Yeah. And he's doing much better than, you know, the the VP of sales, like this chief revenue officer that would cost three or four hundred thousand because they just took this three to six months to learn everything about sales and marketing and the, the whole funnel. Uh-huh. This is the unlock is just learn being able to learn these skills quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's so critical because you can't be excellent at six things at once. No. And and so that's the sort of, you have to prune in order to grow. As you're growing and trying to get bigger, keep going back to what are the one or two things that you're really, really good at. Keep building from there, just like a tree, right? Yeah. If you, the tree wants to grow, you got to prune away the yeah. the extra stuff so yeah. that you can grow. You can't have like 50 limbs that are all the big Vic ones that, you know, it's like, maybe there's three or something. Right. All right, listen. Continued success. You got to go. You got more press to do on your book tour. Congratulations. And the book tour is going well? It is. It is. It's it's like a little overwhelming, but it's also, I mean, you know, when I do research, it's like statistics and findings and stuff. This is like, there's stories in there about me and people I know, and it's so vulnerable in a way. So it's it's yeah. also sort of exhausting and terrifying that people are reading these things I about, love the Elon about, Musk story. Oh, I was, thank I, you. I, I, I was <laughs> tempted. We're friends, and so I was tempted to send the MP3 file to him where you talk about him and i was like i can't do that because the publisher sent me these and you know i don't want to have mp3 i don't know if it's a final one or whatever i'm sure he's heard but i won't say the elon musk story i'll save it for the readers um and then my big unlock for you with the book getting an edge i created angel.university with mike savino and a couple of and jackie here on the staff and uh we did that course 15 times since the book came out and it was my way to meet 50 people 60 people who read the book Uh uh-huh and then teach them to go more in depth what you have here is the beginning of an edge course where you could do getting an edge live uh-huh. and just charge people 300 bucks, include lunch or dinner, and really get to know like the people who've read the book and create like the next level where they can 
work with each other and meet people around the book because books are about community today. Uh -huh. It's not just the information in the book I find. And this was a huge unlock for me because I had maybe a thousand people come to live events like the ones that I'm talking about, Angel University and other, I did dim sum Q and A's, uh, which worked really well. Uh -huh. So are you doing any kind of live, like 50 people, 25 person events? You know, I- That are interactive, they can ask questions and hang out with you? Some are sort of, you know, these Q&A kind mm -hmm. of things, but that's a great suggestion. I need yeah. to figure out how to, how to do that. Make a PowerPoint yeah. and walk people through a course. That's what yeah. we did. And it is so powerful to meet the readers and answer their questions. And then you just feel, you figure out what you left out of the book. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Great Edge suggestion. Edge the course. Thank be you. so great. All right, everybody go buy the book, Laura Huang. It is Edge. Uh, do you have a website for the book or just type I in edge? LauraHuang.net. There it is. H-U-A-N-G. Uh, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.